Hello, I'm Mary. Well, this is my first Q&A video and what I have done is gathered all the questions from my YouTube and photography site on Facebook and gathered them all and found out I have had so many questions. It would be impossible to fit them all into one video. So this is going to be the first of a few. What I've managed to do is put them into categories on this video and I'll make sure that I timestamp them and put them in the description box below as well. So I have been asked a lot of questions and I think one of the most popular ones recently is how am I? <laughs> so thank you for showing your concern and asking how I am. I am very good. I have fully recovered I think now from the PCT. It took a couple of months. I had sore feet for quite a while but I have now got the feeling back in my toes which is always a good thing. I'm keeping busy. I've got loads of things going on at the moment which is why I've not been uploading as many videos as normal. But what I'm planning on doing is making sure that I upload a video every single week and I'm going to do it every single Tuesday at 4pm GMT and if I have extra things I want to do I will put them out on as well during the week but minimum of once a week from now on on a Tuesday. So I hope that suits everybody. So let's dive into the questions and as always if you've got any comments or any further questions feel free to put them in the comments section below. So, the first ones are about my camera and phone whilst I was out on the PCT. John DeVita, John and Bucko's Adventures, Rona Theobald and Eric Venningson, as well as Chris Hollenbach, Tracky Boy, Marilyn Rochat, I apologise if I'm pronouncing everybody's names wrong, and all asked me about what camera I use, what um, phone I use out there. So I use the Canon G7X Mark II for vlogging and that was my primary source of videoing on the PCT. I also took out my phone which was an iPhone 7 and I only used that on a couple of occasions to do videoing and <laughs> that was when I actually broke my camera. When I fell over, broke my ribs, broke my camera and the shutter opening the lens thing was not working so I had to wait till I got to town so for one or two days I did use my camera to video but I didn't like it because the image stabilization on it was not very good so as I'm walking along with my arm in the air it was very kind of shaky whereas with the G7X it has got an anti-shake system in it which is why I only used my camera so I hope that answers that question um the few people have also been asking how I edited my videos and what app I used or what software I used. I only used iMovie and I have always used that at home before I went out on trail. Found it absolutely fine. I am wanting to upgrade because there is a lot of limitations in it but what I didn't want to do is get an expensive one that had too much complications on it before I went out. I wanted something that's very simple to use on trail and I used iMovie, downloaded the app onto my phone and edited all my videos on there. Somebody asked as well, what, am I using a dead kitty? <laughs> if anyone doesn't know what a dead kitty is, it's one of those fluffy things that goes on top of the microphone. Yes, I am using something of those sorts. What I actually did was get something to go over the microphone and what this does, it's something that's fluffy, I'll try and insert a photograph of it, and it covers the microphone so it helps prevent wind noise, which is extremely loud on a microphone if it's not covered. Most of the time to prevent wind noise I just tried not to talk at the same time when it was windy out on trail, there was a few occasions I had to do it and I had that on permanently so it did help diffuse the wind noise a little bit, but it wasn't a official brand or anything like that. We actually got a bit of a hat, a bit of Velcro and stuck it on. So it was extremely cheap and cheerful to do. You don't have to spend a fortune to get things like that. Mr. Polite Polite asks, is that USB charge plug universal American pin type? And what he's talking about is the Anchor Quick Charge wall plug, which I'll just get for you now. And that is the wall plug. And the one I have got is a UK version. And if you go on the Anchor website or Amazon, depending on what country you're in, you can get different attachments for it. But this one came with a UK version. You can't take this one off. But on the US one, it's a nice one and it also folds up, whereas the UK one doesn't. So yes, the UK one I got. 
Douglas asks me, are you using your Garmin to keep in contact with people back home or are you using a cell provider as well? Most of the time I used my mobile phone and I had a contract with AT&T and that is how I contacted people at home most of the time. However, I used my Garmin when I didn't have signal on the trail and also every single night what I would do is send a preset message to home, letting them know I was at camp and that I was safe and every single morning I'd also send a preset message letting them know I was setting off for the day as well. If I got into any tricky, tricky situations or needed any help and I was out of service, it was a great tool to have because I was able to just instantly message on it and people at home would get notified via email or via text message and be able to reply to me on the Garmin. There sometimes was a little bit of delay depending on the satellite signal, but it worked really well for me. I think on trail, probably 85% of the time I had service on my mobile phone and the other 15% of the time it was fine because I knew I had my satellite phone as well which was great. Now I've had an awful lot of questions asking me how I managed to vlog on trail. Did I do it all myself? What did I use? How did I upload? How did I use my camera integrated with my phone system? How I use the app? Everything like that. So what I'm planning on doing is my next video that comes out in a week's time will be about how I vlogged on trail. So I'm going to show you the process. I'm also going to go out into the the hills and show you what I did and how I did it. So it will be a little bit more hands on, I'll be able to show you everything and I hope that answers a lot more questions than me just trying to talk around the houses today. So look out for that next week and that will answer all the questions on how I vlogged on trail. And yes, I did do it all myself, nobody helped me. Now I had a few other questions on electronics. One from Mike Linky. And he asked, when you are checking your trail on your GPS, are you using the Garmin inReach or your phone? So I very rarely used my Garmin whilst out on trail to check where the trail is, so for directions and navigation. I tended to use gut hooks, which I actually delayed getting to start off with because I didn't think I needed it. I had paper maps and I also had half mile, but everybody was using gut hooks and the feature that I liked about it the most was the fact that you had water reports on there People constantly updated it, letting you know about water caches and things that were happening along the trail. And I found that really useful. So I did succumb and get gut hooks. And I would say I used that nearly the whole trail. I only ever had one or two slight problems with that and it didn't last very long when I did use it. It was just sometimes it didn't quite find out where I was. So I did use my Garmin in reach. And the reason I used that most because is because I preferred to save my battery on my mobile phone, so it wasn't anything wrong that was with gut hooks, you know, gut hooks was absolutely fine, but when I was using it and when it was freezing cold and you have your phone out, you're using GPS, you're using your signal on it, the battery dies extremely quickly. So I ended up using my InReach Explorer and I had the Plus version which has the map screen on it as well. And I used that to navigate when it was cold because I didn't want my battery to die on my phone. I also have another question about electronics from Marilyn and she said when there's no connection to gut hooks did you regularly navigate with Garmin? So yes I did, that and my paper maps as well and I'd say gut hooks was 99% perfect whilst out on trail. I think everybody that I saw using it had maybe one problem with it once during the entirety of the trail. It was very rare that it went wrong. But again, you are relying on devices. And also, it may be a perfect app, it may be greatly designed, but if your battery dies on your mobile phone and there's no way of charging it up, you still need to be able to navigate. So that's why I had my inReach as well as paper maps as well. So you always need a backup. Now I've had some questions about my tent. One's from Tracky Boy, and he's asking, how's the tiger wall tent doing for you? And it did extremely well for me. I loved that tent, I really did. So much so I'm gonna do a whole video about it and explain why I liked it, what tiny little niggles I had with it whilst out on trail. But to me, I was out there for seven months with a very lightweight tent, which was only three season, and I survived. <laughs> and the tent survived as well, and I will still continue using that tent. So I think seven months, nearly every single night of using that tent is pretty good and I would highly recommend that to anybody. I loved it. The only slight little problems I had with it, the main problems I had with it, 
with the fact that the guy lines broke once when it was extremely windy, but to be fair, Big Agnes do say that in very strong winds and high winds, you shouldn't actually be in that tent because it isn't equipped for it. And the other thing I had was the mesh did get a few little holes in it, but I think that's just general wear and tear of having a tent. Now I've had an awful lot of people asking me about kitchen items as well. One person, Gary Khan, he asked me, did you keep your water filter from freezing? And I had an awful lot of comments on my videos about my water filter. I used the soya squeeze as well as the pouches that came with it. And yes, I did manage to keep it from freezing. Not once did it freeze. However, a little word of caution. When that freezes, you don't necessarily know that it's frozen because what will happen is the insides freeze and then make it so that the filter doesn't filter the water properly, but you might not know it. So every time I knew that it was gonna be a cold night, I slept with that water filter in a little bag inside my sleeping bag. And I think I did that way more than I needed to, but I did not want that freezing on me. I didn't want to get sick with anything. So I kept it nice and snug and warm with me at night in my sleeping tent in my sleeping bag and I have not had any problems and I didn't get sick and I used that thing every single day so it was a good good device I think a few people have used other options for filtering water I never saw anyone else actually using anything other than soya squeeze but I know some people have done because they were talking about it but it was a really successful um, system for filtering water I liked it Vesbolk, I think that's how you pronounce it, told me <laughs> the clip on your spoon bothers me. <laughs> Are you going to carry it all the way to Canada? <sighs> this is the clip he's referring to on my spork and I'm sorry, I'm sorry it bothered you, didn't bother me and yes I carried it all the way to Canada. I liked the clip on it and for the sake of probably two grams. I thought it was great because I used it for different things. I also clipped it onto the inside of the brain in my bag so that when I was having lunch during the day, it wouldn't just fall out because I did use that top part quite a lot and I was always worried that this would fall out. So I clipped that to a hook attachment within the brain. And I also used it for a few other items and I liked it, so I'm sorry you didn't. <laughs> Kevin B asks me, in your travels through Washington and Oregon, I was not aware of you having bear spray or food hangs, despite bear footprints, etc. What precautions did you take? And somebody else asked me, which is Ward Maxwell, and what did you do for food storage when not carrying a bear vault? Did you hang your food up a tree, use an ursac or sleep with it? I carried a bear canister, the BV, I think it was the... I've forgotten, the, I think it was 500, I think that's what it was called, my brain's gone to mush. I carried that in all the areas that I needed to, and a little bit longer. And I loved having all my food in there, but it was an extremely heavy thing to carry when you don't need to. And in all the areas that I didn't carry it, but thought that there was going to be problems, so when we heard about bear activity, saw footprints, anything like that, I tended to hang my food bag and I kept all my food in an Osprey bag which was a 20 litre bag and I kind of sealed it all up, put all the food in there and hung it from a tree away from my tent when I knew that there was going to be problems. But other than that I tended to sleep with my food, I didn't have any other issues, I, I put it in my bag and then I put it into the Theo, was it the Neo Air pump sack bag? And then I put that into my actual uh, rucksack and then closed the lid. So I felt that it was not completely scent free, but I disguised it as much as possible. A few people did sleep with their food and left it just lying around in their tent. And I heard a lot of people had problems with mice chewing through the tents and the mesh of the tents. So that is something to be careful of. Marilyn asks me about water and there's quite a few questions here. So the maximum water I could carry, which was six and a half litres. What were my various water containers? So I had a platypus two litre, a soya squeeze pouch bag thing, which was one litre, 
a Evan New bag which was one and a half litre and I also then carried two either smart water bottles or life water bottles which held one litre each. So my maximum capacity was six and a half litres if I needed it and that was during the desert sections. She also asks the longest I went between water sources. That was probably north of Tehachapi and it was about 35 miles, 36 miles was that water carry so it was a pretty hefty one and that was when it was extremely hot as well so yeah you have to take that into account when you're buying a rucksack that you've got a lot of water to carry in certain sections so you need to make sure that your backpack will carry that load. Someone also asks what was the heaviest my pack was with all my food and all my water so maximum food and maximum water. Um, <laughs> wow that was probably oh when you're carrying six and a half litres of water, that works out at over 14 pounds. And my food, I'd say, sometimes got up to about the same when I was carrying a week's worth of food. So just that in itself, you're looking at 28 pounds, and that's just for food and water, plus my base weight. So I would say I think the heaviest I ever got to, which was very, very rare, and if it was, it was only for a day or two, would probably be about 56. Oh, sorry, not 50, <laughs> about 47 pounds. Yeah, 47, 48 pounds is the absolute maximum. But what you tended to find that was when there was a long water carry, you would resupply more regularly, so you wouldn't have to carry as much food. And vice versa, if you had a long amount of, um, a, a large amount of food to carry, you would buy different styles of food to keep the weight down as well. I have had an awful lot of questions about my umbrella. The first one was, did I use it and did I find it useful and would I recommend it? So yes, I used it quite a lot. I didn't always film when I was using it because holding new umbrella and a video camera or trying to balance it never worked out well. So it didn't look like I used it that much on my videos, but I did. What I tended to do was put the umbrella away and then film and then put the umbrella back up again. So I used that an awful lot in the desert section because I am quite pale skinned, I'm from England, we don't get a great deal of harsh sun like you do in California and every time I stopped and took a break when it was hot weather I also made sure that I was under that umbrella because it just kept you cooler. In the heat of the day it was, some of the temperatures got so hot. I would highly recommend carrying an umbrella, it was definitely worth the wait for me. I didn't find it would be useful to carry it for the rain. A lot of people have questioned why I got rid of it and why didn't I keep it for Washington when it was raining a lot and it was just too cumbersome to carry. I, did, I couldn't physically hold it with my hand because I was always using my trekking poles and in Washington it's extremely steep. Your elevation, um, so your ascent and descent all the time is crazy. So carrying an umbrella and trying to go up and down hills would have been impossible for me. I know a few people did carry one, very very few though, but it was definitely worth it for the sun and a lot of people have asked me how I attached it to my pack as well. So I have this weird little grip thing, if you can see this. All it is, it's a piece of kind of plasticky material and you can shape it and squirrel it round however you want. So what I would do is I would tie that into the loop of my backpack strap and they usually had little elastic things on them. So I'd hook it through the elastic hook, I'd put my umbrella there <laughs> and then what I would do is twizzle it round as tightly as possible and eventually it would kind of wedge in just right. Sometimes it would whack me in the head when it got a little bit windy but I, I that's all I did, that's how I held it up on myself. I will point out when it was very windy that did not work so well and the amount of times I ended up in a bush because the wind would just take me and I'd be trying to hold onto my umbrella and it would all be going on but it, it helped me most of the time but when it was windy it didn't. When it was windy I just gave up with the umbrella and put it away because it, it would just go inside out and get broken but yeah I got rid of that probably around about the Sierra section I just gave it away to somebody to use for next year. The rest of the questions don't exactly fit into any particular category so I'm just going to read them out and answer them as we go. So the first one is by Karen W and she asks me what do I carry in the small bag on my left shoulder and this is the said bag. So this is an Om Go Pod and I attached this to my pack when I had the small one because it didn't have a waist belt with it 
and I initially got it thinking I'd be able to fit my iPhone in it and it would be really convenient. But on the Asia bag, which I had, which was a 45 litre, the straps came round and as this attached to it, it kind of bent the bag. I could not get my phone in and out of this easily because the protective case that I've got on my phone has a bit of a sticky texture to it. So as it was going in, it just kept getting jammed all the time. So I ended up giving up and didn't use it for that reason. I ended up putting in this my lip balm, my sunscreen, sometimes cliff bars or nuts and seeds, things like that. I also put the earphones in there for when I wanted to listen to music through my phone and also my small Swiss army knife which I kept at hand all the time as well just in case I needed it. So that was what was in that. John asked me did I have an ice axe and did I know how to sell for rest? So yes I got an ice axe, I picked that up when I got to Kennedy Meadows and yes, I did know how to use it. I'd watched countless videos on how to self-arrest and as soon as I got into the snow and onto the slopes, I went and got some training by people that knew how to do it when I got out into the Sierra. I think I posted my first ever attempt at self-arresting on one of my vlogs. It was quite poor, but it was my very first attempt and I did practice a lot more after that before we got to the area where you really needed to know how to use it. And it was frightening to start with, but I am so glad I practiced because it saved my life. When I fell off the, <laughs> the edge of the pass, I managed to self-arrest successfully. And I, all I kept thinking was, thank goodness I practiced because my instinct just kicked in. When I slipped off the ridge and I was going down, I just didn't even think, it's, it was so strange. I just went into automatic pilot because I'd practiced over and over again whilst I was out on the snow. So I would highly recommend anybody who's gonna get an ice axe, either get one before you go out on trail and practice, or if you do have to leave it to when you get on trail, then make sure you practice before you get to any sketchy areas and don't just practice once or twice, do it a few times so it becomes automatic and from different positions and angles as well. Alan Schuber asked me, did I get my Crocs back? <laughs> yes, I did get my Crocs back. There was a lovely girl that I met along trail called Flower and she was so sweet. She was, her partner was Superman and she picked them up for me because we'd met earlier on the trail and she carried them for me and we were reunited, which was excellent. And I couldn't have done without those Crocs because I loved them on trail. I loved having something that I could just walk about camping, weren't my trainers and they were so comfortable and going through shallow rivers or stream crossings in them were great. Marilyn asked me, one power cube with four recharges or what did you carry? So I think that's referring to how did I power up my devices. I carried a portable charger by Anchor and that was called the PowerCore 2 20,000 and that charged my iPhone 7 six and a half times and the reason I purchased that as well is it also had a quick charge facility on it so I could actually charge up that power bank within five hours because what I didn't want is something that usually takes about eight hours to 12 hours to charge up because when you're out on trail and you, there's lots of hikers in a area all the power outlets get used up very quickly and you end up having to leave your belongings either overnight or just wait around or not be able to fully charge it. So I had the plug that you saw earlier, which allowed me to use the fast charge system on it, and which I think it does it like four times faster than an ordinary charger. And my power bank obviously had the fast charge ability on it as well, so that worked really well for me. I also used that power bank to charge up my phone, as well as my Garmin InReach, and that was pretty much all I used it for. My Garmin InReach probably only needed charging up once whilst out for a week. It usually lasted about four days or something like that without me having to charge it. And my camera, I ended up taking three batteries in total. So that usually only got charged maybe once or twice as well. So I had a good four charges, I'd say, of my phone left. But I ended up keeping it in airplane mode all the time to reduce the amount of um, battery I was losing. So. That is all I took, so just that one power bank. There were, I'm not gonna lie, there were times when I wish I had more. 
because it was very difficult trying to keep on top of everything being charged, especially when it got very cold. But for the weight that it would have give, uh, added to my pack, it just was not worth it. So I think one power bank was plenty. Now Steve asks me, crampons or micro spikes? Now this is a tricky question for me to answer because I cannot say I personally have had any experience with crampons, but let me give you my take on it based on what I saw and witnessed whilst out on trail. I hiked the PCT in a very high snow year and I have seen footage of people that did it last year or a few years ago and it doesn't look the same, it's crazy how much snow we got this year. I only used micro spikes and at one point I was considering swapping them to crampons because there was an awful lot of snow but I decided to stay with micro spikes and see how I got on with them and yes I know I fell off <laughs> a pass but I would have still fallen off that same pass had I been wearing um, the crampons. The reason being is because where I actually fell was on a slushy to soft bit of snow. It wasn't firm and crampons are only good in firm or hard snow or on ice. Now I'm not going to lie, there were times when I wish I had crampons because it would have made my life a lot easier and I'd have felt a lot more secure. But A, I'd never tried hiking in crampons before and that in itself if you don't have practice and you don't know how to hike in them they can actually be dangerous because you can slip on them you can twist your ankle and you can struggle i've had people that i hiked with that used crampons and they liked them they would highly recommend them and said that they felt a lot more secure and grounded there were situations where I was in my micro spikes and somebody else was in their crampons and they were doing much better at hiking than me. So in one way I would say yes I recommend crampons if the snow is going to be hard and if you're going to get long stretches of it. But personally I did okay. I was absolutely fine in my micro spikes. I liked the fact that when there was some stretches that was a bit slushy or the snow was very soft or not very deep, I could keep on my spikes all day long if I wanted to, whereas if you were wearing crampons you'd be stopping and taking them on and off a lot more regularly, so I did like that. They were very comfortable, they weren't very heavy, there wasn't much room for going over on your ankle or anything like that and they worked very well with trail runners. Crampons, I believe, work best with boots. I'm not giving advice, it's just what I've heard people say from out on the trail, but that is what I believe to be true, is that the crampons are great, but you should be wearing boots for them because you do need the ankle support with them, whereas with the micro spikes, they are better on trail runners. But if I had to turn the clocks back, I would get hiking boots and not trail runners for the Sierra section and also for the snow towards the end in Oregon and I would also have made sure that I wore crampons through the very tough section in the Sierra with hiking boots and I'd have swapped probably my crampons then for my micro spikes when the snow got softer again, so yes. And somebody else also asked me about visas. There has been a lot of comments on my channel about the fact that I was over in the US longer than six months and what did I do about it? So just to clarify, I had a visa which was a multiple entry visa which allowed me to re-enter the US. There's no limit on it, you can re-enter as many times as you want, but obviously it does rely on the customs and it does rely on your purpose and why you're doing it. And if they become suspicious, everybody is in their right to stop you entering back into the US. Because I had a clear purpose, I was hiking the PCT. I got into the country, I hiked the hike, I walked through Washington and I walked into Canada. From Canada I then went to Vancouver airport and flew back into the US. When I did that I got my visa renewed by a customs officer. So I'd said that I'd recently got into Canada and that I'd walked through, I was hiking the PCT and he said to me, how long do you need, how, how much extra do you need? And I kind of was like, well, if you could give me an extra few weeks just in case. And he was like, I'll just give you another six months, don't worry about it. And he renewed my visa for another six months without any problems. He was extremely friendly. And it is a re-entry visa, so because I was going from Canada back into the US, I was allowed to have that kind of discussion about it. 
other people have applied for extensions because they weren't leaving the US. So they would apply for an extension which cost hundreds of pounds and you weren't guaranteed to get it even after you'd paid those hundreds of pounds and I didn't want to do that route. And I knew that I should, I would be absolutely fine going from the, the Canadian border back into the US because I knew that it was just going to be for a few extra weeks. And I'm not recommending that anybody relies on that because it is completely up to the customs officer that you see in front of you when you were boarding that plane. I rang up and got advice on it and I was told it was a grey area. <laughs> so that kind of says it all but I kind of knew that things would work out because when I left the US into Canada and before I was coming back I hadn't done my full six months. I still had space left so I knew worst case scenario when I came back into the US if they weren't going to renew it or extend it or give me another visa to as a class as a re-entry I would just hike really fast <laughs> and make sure that I got out before the end of the six months so that hope that clarifies the visa situation I hope you have enjoyed this video and all the questions and answers that I've gone through today it has been fun to go through it because I have been asked these questions so many times I've still got so many more to go through, so I think the next video is probably going to be a bit of a random question and answers, things that I can't particularly put into categories. And the one after that is probably going to be a food related one. And the reason I'm keeping that separate is because I don't think everybody's going to be so interested in all the food and nutrition and all the resupplies within a whole Q&A video. So I'll do a separate one designated to just that. I'm also going to make sure that I film next week and show you exactly how I vlogged on trail, how I used iMovie and how I got all the pictures from my camera to my phone and then uploaded it to YouTube so I'll go through all that as well and I'll make sure that I do some of it outside so you don't see me sitting indoors all the time but the weather has been pretty horrific recently. I'm also going to do all my photographs at the moment so you'll probably notice a lot more activity on Instagram and my Facebook photography page so I'll keep uploading things on that. And as I said earlier, I will make sure that I put out new videos every Tuesday at 4pm GMT and if you want to get notified when I do new videos as well as those one that is going to come out, make sure you subscribe to my channel and click on the bell notification so you get notified. And until next time, goodbye!